morning. My name is Beth Routledge and I'm a consultant physician in Forth Valley Royal Hospital in Scotland. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you all today and I'm very grateful to the College and to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh for inviting me. In the next 20 minutes, we're going to cover the major hypertensive disorders of pregnancy and how they relate to each other, the pharmacological options for managing hypertension in pregnancy, the management of preeclampsia and eclampsia, the indications for escalating patients from the ward-based environment to an area of enhanced care, and the options for managing patients during their postpartum period. The hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are an umbrella term that encompasses chronic hypertension, gestational hypertension, and preeclampsia and eclampsia. And we define hypertension in pregnancy the same way we'd, we would define hypertension outside of pregnancy. So a systolic blood pressure of greater than 140 or a diastolic of greater than 90. In the context of the pregnant patient, we define chronic hypertension as hypertension that's known to exist before pregnancy or hypertension that presents for the first time during pregnancy, but before 20 weeks of gestation. And we define gestational hypertension as hypertension that develops at or after 20 weeks of gestation. Worldwide, these are among the most common disorders of pregnancy and they affect 8 to 10% of all pregnancies. The most recent guidelines from the Sri Lanka College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, which were published last year, suggest that this prevalence is similar for patients in Sri Lanka. In the latter half of the 20th century, we improved the early identification of patients at risk of the hypertensive disorders during pregnancy, and we developed robust guidelines on how to manage these patients. This led to a steep decline in maternal mortality due to hypertension, such that in the West, less than one woman in every million who gives birth now dies from preeclampsia. And the confidential inquiry into maternal deaths and morbidity, which is carried out every three years in the UK and Ireland by Embrace UK, identified that in the three years between 2009 and 2014, only 14 patients died as a result of a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy. That's significantly less than half the number of patients who had died in the three years before. But on the other hand, as we get better at managing this cohort of patients, the size of the cohort continues to grow. In 2019, an analysis of over 150 million women in the United States was published by Pandey and Anth and colleagues at Rutgers University. It demonstrates a significant rise in the number of women who are entering pregnancy with pre-existing hypertension. Similarly, an analysis of over 51 million live births by Natalie Cameron and colleagues at Northwestern showed a marked increase in the last 12 years in women in both urban and rural areas of the US who develop new onset hypertension during pregnancy. The major risk of hypertension during pregnancy, either pre-existing hypertension or gestational hypertension, is preeclampsia. And the classical definition of preeclampsia is new hypertension at or after 20 weeks of gestation, and that's accompanied by evidence of organ dysfunction. We can divide the organ dysfunction into proteinuria or evidence of maternal organ dysfunction, which includes acute kidney injury, liver dysfunction, neurological signs or symptoms, hemolysis or thrombocytopenia, and it that includes the constellation of hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and thrombocytopenia, which makes up the disorder we know as HELP syndrome. Or evidence of utero placental dysfunction, which can manifest as fetal growth restriction, abnormal Doppler of the umbilical artery, or stillbirth. The diagnosis of preeclampsia only requires one of these options, not all of them, and a patient who does not have proteinuria but does fulfill the criteria in some other way, can still be diagnosed with preeclampsia. The diagnosis of superimposed preeclampsia on chronic hypertension is much less clear cut, but we can still make a diagnosis if a patient with chronic hypertension presents with any of the maternal organ dysfunctions that we've listed here as being associated with preeclampsia. This does include proteinuria, but in patients whose hypertension comes with pre-existing proteinuria renal disease, that obviously isn't sufficient to make a diagnosis, 
and a rising level of proteinuria is also not sufficient to make the diagnosis. Let me briefly talk you through this simplified diagram of how the pathophysiology of blood pressure works in pregnancy. The beginning of pregnancy is marked by a decrease in blood pressure, and this persists until about 24 weeks of gestation. It's caused by the release of the hormones estrogen, progesterone, and relaxin, and this causes a decrease in systemic vascular resistance and therefore vasodilatation, causing a falling BP. A competing pathway, which occurs at the same time, is both extra renal release of renin, which comes from the ovaries and the maternal decidua, and increased circulating levels of estrogen, which causes the liver to synthesize increased levels of angiotensinogen. These two mechanisms together augment the renin angiotensin aldosterone syndrome, sorry, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system which increases plasma volume, which in turn increases stroke volume, and together with the physiological increase in maternal heart rate, this causes an increase in cardiac output. This contributes to an increase in blood pressure, and as pregnancy progresses beyond the 24th week of gestation, this causes the blood pressure to gradually rise back to pre-pregnancy levels. The development of preeclampsia is mediated by the placenta. In normal placental development, as illustrated on the left-hand side of this diagram, there is cytotrophoblastic invasion of the spiral arteries of the uterus. This causes the spiral arteries to develop correctly, specifically with dilatation of the distal segment of the spiral artery, which is illustrated by the thick orange segment, which represents the spiral artery. This dilatation reduces the speed of incoming blood to the uterine villi, which allows adequate time for oxygen exchange. If, as illustrated on the right-hand side of the diagram, there is inadequate cytotrophoblastic invasion as occurs in preeclampsia, there's very little or no dilatation at all of the distal segment, and that causes the blood, spurt, blood to spurt into the uterine veins at increased speed and turbulence. This damages the villi and forms ecogenic cystic lesions, which you can see at the top of the pink arrow. And this is lined by thrombus, which is the tangerine colored area. It also reduces the time available for oxygen exchange because blood is moving so much faster. And when this occurs, that leads to placental ischemia. This induces a cascade of inflammatory events, which leads to widespread endothelial dysfunction and to the multi-system organ dysfunction in both the mother and in the fetus through uteroplacental dysfunction, which we've already described. All patients who are thought to be at high risk of preeclampsia are offered low-dose aspirin from 12 weeks gestation up until delivery, and all high-risk patients who have insufficient calcium intake in their diet should also be offered supplementary oral calcium, as there is some evidence that maintaining adequate levels can prevent preeclampsia from occurring. We think of any patient with one high risk factor to be at high risk. This includes patients with chronic hypertension, hypertensive disease in a previous pregnancy, chronic kidney disease, autoimmune diseases such as antiphospholipid syndrome or SLE, and diabetes. There are also moderate risk factors, and any patient who collects more than one moderate risk factor is also considered to be at high risk. This includes patients who are 40 years old or more, patients in their first pregnancy, patients pregnant with twins or triplets, patients who have an interval between pregnancies of more than 10 years, patients with a BMI of 35 or more at their booking visit, and patients who have a family history of preeclampsia. We recommend that all patients who have high blood pressure should have a baseline full blood count, LFTs, coagulation screen, serum creatinine, electrolytes, and a urinalysis to assess for protein or albumin creatinine ratio done. And this includes patients who present with the hypertension before 20 weeks, because if we develop a suspicion of superimposed preeclampsia later on, it will be really helpful to have that baseline. The general principles of how you manage hypertension in pregnancy pharmacologically are as follows. If a patient is already on antihypertensive treatment and they become pregnant, 
they should generally continue on what they were already on. If this is an ACE inhibitor, an alternative should be offered because ACE inhibitors are contraindicated during pregnancy. Any patient who presents with previously undiagnosed hypertension at any point in pregnancy should be offered pharmacological therapy. This is irrespective of whether they present before or after 20 weeks of gestation. And any patient who presents with severe hypertension, which we define as a systolic of greater than 160 or a diastolic of greater than 110, if they present after 20 weeks of gestation, they should be admitted for pharmacological therapy and monitoring. This table illustrates the pharmacological options for managing hypertension during pregnancy. And it lists through from the first line drug labetalol, a second line drug of nifedipine, and the third line of methaldopa. These are well-established recommendations and they are agreed on by the NICE guidelines in the UK and by the International Society for the Treatment of Hypertensive Disorders in Pregnancy. One thing that I would draw your attention to is that in patients who are of Black, African or Caribbean ethnic origin, rather than using labetalol as a first-line drug, we use nifedipine as a first-line drug and then labetalol becomes the second line drug in that, in that instance. Hydralazine is a further option for managing hypertension if you're really not getting control. It should be reserved for patients with severe hypertension and should only be used in a critical care setting. These patients should be monitored while on hydralazine and as our obstetrics and gynecology colleagues will be aware, it can induce maternal tachycardia, which can cause issues with the CTG trace for the baby. One thing I would like to highlight is a couple of drugs which shouldn't be used. ACE inhibitors, as I've mentioned, are contraindicated in pregnancy. These are associated with abnormal development of the fetal kidneys, non-closure of the patent ductus arteriosus, abnormal development of the fetal skeleton, particularly in the skull bones, and fetal growth restriction. They can, however, be safely used in the postpartum period, and I will come on to that later. Diuretics are not recommended for use as an antihypertensive agent. Loop diuretics are not contraindicated in pregnancy, and they can be safely used to treat pulmonary edema, which is something that can occur with preeclampsia, but shouldn't be used solely to treat hypertension. The thiocyte diuretics, however, are contraindicated, and that is because they can cause decreased placental perfusion and also carry a risk of neonatal thrombocytopenia. As I mentioned a little while ago, the definitive management for preeclampsia is removal of the placenta. However, NICE guidelines and the International Society for the Study of Hypertension in Pregnancy agree that delivery shouldn't be before 37 weeks if it can be at all avoided. The mainstay of management before delivery is aggressive pharmacological control of blood pressure. It should be noted that there is high risk of pulmonary edema with preeclampsia and therefore careful fluid management is essential. Maintenance fluids ideally should be limited to 80 mils an hour. And if there are specific indications or concerns about the patient's fluid status, such as, for example, there is a coexisting obstetric hemorrhage or a renal dysfunction, we should ideally be giving cautious boluses of IV crystalloid rather than using just larger volumes of faster fluid. This would also be an indication to think about invasive monitoring such as an arterial line. The indications for delivering before 37 weeks would be if maternal blood pressure isn't controlled to less than 160 over 110, despite using three or more antihypertensive classes of drugs in appropriate doses a progressive deterioration in maternal organ function, 
maternal oxygen levels are persistently less than 90% despite appropriate treatment of pulmonary edema. Neurological features, which includes the development of eclamptic seizures, placental abruption, or any concerns about the fetal status, which may be things like abnormal Doppler findings, a non-reassuring CTG trace, or stillbirth. The only drug recommended for the use of for use for treating eclamptic seizures is magnesium sulfate. However, it's also used in preeclampsia with severe hypertension, defined as a blood pressure of greater than 160 over 110 with proteinuria, or preeclampsia with non-severe hypertension but developing neurological signs or symptoms. This includes eclamptic seizures, but it also includes intractable headache and development of central scotoma, for example. The dosing regime for magnesium sulfate, which again has been agreed by national and international guidelines, is a four gram IV bolus over five to 15 minutes, and then a one gram per hour IV infusion for at least 24 hours. If the drug has been started because there are eclamptic seizures, the infusion should be continued for at least 24 hours after the last seizure. If there are recurrent seizures while the infusion is running, further boluses can be given and the dose recommended for this is two to four grams, again over five to 15 minutes. There is no evidence at all to support the use of any other anticonvulsant for eclamptic seizures and that includes benzodiazepines. There are a number of indications for patients who have preeclampsia to be transferred out of the ward environment into a high dependency unit or to an area of enhanced maternal care if that's a facility available. Recommendations are that this should include patients who have had or are having eclamptic seizures, patients with severe preeclampsia, which we define pragmatically as patients who meet criteria for severe hypertension who have preeclampsia, patients who are oliguric pre-delivery, patients who are oliguric at two hours post-delivery, and patients who are requiring any intravenous antihypertensive agents and any patient with a coagulopathy. In practice, we would also recommend that any patient who is causing the multidisciplinary team any cause for alarm should also be thought about taking to an area of enhanced care. An underlooked area, but one that we as physicians may well be asked to get involved in, is the question of then how we manage these patients in their postpartum period. In general, any patient who was on an antihypertensive prior to delivery should remain on it in the postpartum period. These patients should be observed for 72 hours before discharge with four times daily BP monitoring. The exception to this rule is patients who were on methyl dopa during pregnancy. If this is the case, methyl dopa should be stopped and an alternative agent should be introduced if needed. They should still be observed for the 72 hours with the blood pressure monitoring, as I mentioned before. If a new drug does need to be started in the postpartum period, UK guidelines as of 2019 would be to use an ACE inhibitor as first line, preferably enalapril. In Patients of Black, African or Caribbean ethnic origin, first line would be a calcium channel blocker such as nifedipine. We can be a little more liberal with blood pressure targets after delivery, but if blood pressure isn't controlled to less than 150 over 100, the drug dose should be increased or we should think about adding an additional drug. And if patients are discharged on antihypertensives, they need to have a two week review with their primary care physician or with the hospital. Realistically, for some patients who develop gestational hypertension, this will actually have been an unmasking of a chronic hypertensive disorder. And those patients will need followed up as we would follow up any newly hypertensive patient. Once blood pressure is controlled to 140 over 90, we can think about stepping down medication, first by reducing doses and then by dropping agents. And finally, patients do need to be informed of the risk of developing a further hypertensive disorder of pregnancy if they become pregnant again in the future. All patients who have had gestational hypertension or preeclampsia will be treated as high risk in subsequent pregnancies and will therefore be offered prophylaxis with aspirin. 
but they should also be warned that 53%, which is one in two, will develop gestational hypertension again. 16% or one in six will develop preeclampsia again. And this risk rises to 25% if in this pregnancy they had severe hypertension, HELP syndrome, eclampsia, or a preterm birth before 34 weeks. It rises further again to 55% or more than one in two if in this pregnancy they had a preterm birth at earlier than 28 weeks. Thank you all very much for listening. It's been a pleasure to